Thank you for tuning into our service today. We believe so strongly that the presence of God and the Word of God have the power to change your life. That's why we are committed to bringing these services into your home. I can't think of anything more important than sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world. Now, if these broadcasts are an encouragement to you, there are a couple of simple things I would ask you to do so that we can touch others and continue to be a blessing to you. First, either like or share this video by clicking the appropriate icon on the screen. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And finally, consider sending a financial donation to help us as we bring hope to the hopeless and healing to those who are hurting. Now, there are a few different ways that you can partner with us. You can donate through our website at libertychurchmi.com give. You can give through the donate button on the Church Center app, or you can simply mail your donation to the address on the screen. God is moving powerfully at Liberty Church. We are in the midst of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit as we passionately pursue God's presence together. Thank you for joining us. And now here's today's message. We're going to continue our series this morning called Family Matters. And again, we're trying to make this uh, information something that's applicable to everyone. We know that all of you are at a different place, some married, some unmarried, some never married, some uh, who are, are widows, some who are, have grandchildren, some who don't have any children. And so we're taking these principles and helping you to see how they apply to even just the family of God, to us being a family, a church family. And so I want you to look at these things today through where you're at, through the eyes of your perspective. No matter where you're at today, some of you are looking to get married, some of you have been married, some of you are struggling in your marriage. Some of you are in the twilight years of your marriage. So these principles are great principles that can help you in any place that you are. Some of you, maybe this is just great relationship information. We're going to begin our journey today in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes some powerful words starting in verse 12. He says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted, the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. I want to focus first this morning in our introduction on on that part of the verse that says the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. You know, a lot of us, when we go through something, there's an old song that says, nobody knows the struggles I've seen, troubles I've seen, well, however it goes. You think you're the only one that's struggling with what you're struggling with. You think you're the only one that that has issues in your relationships. You're the only one financially that's going through what you're going through. You're the only one uh, uh, relationally. Nobody seems to understand you. Nobody knows what you're going through. Folks, it's very clear that the The Bible says that every temptation that you go through, every struggle that you go through is not different from what others experience. And I I laugh because, uh, and you know this morning, my wife and I mentioned it last week, this is our wedding anniversary today, October 18th, 1986, we got married. This is our 34th wedding anniversary. And I laugh sometimes because people will come up to me and say, you know, I know you're a pastor, you don't understand these things that you're going through, as if we have an absolute perfect relationship. Oh, if you only knew some of the struggles we've had and the challenges that we've had. We argue. Can you believe that? We argue sometimes. Yeah, we're human. Thanks, Jerry. We are human, and we have some struggles. We've had some financial struggles over the years. We've had some relational struggles over the years. We've had what I like to call many moments of very intense fellowship from time to time. And uh, But I love this woman with all of my heart. She's been my partner, my best friend for 34 years. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. Amen. We've raised two beautiful children. Uh, we have an adorable, adorable grandchild that we got to watch Friday overnight. Um, he got up at five in the morning, and I got to spend some grandpa time when he was laughing and giggling and just having a great time. Those are moments that I will uh, know I, I have to cherish for many, many years to come. So, But, you know, this is more than a series on family. This is a divorce uh, prevention series. This is not condemnation to you if you've been through a divorce. But this is something that I believe is designed 
to help. You'd think sometimes in the church that Christian families would be more immune to these things, but the statistics among Christian families are no different from many of the families in this world. And I do believe that divorce is acceptable in some cases, and the Bible spells that. I'm not going to get out into those teachings today, but in cases of adultery and things like that. But remarriage after divorce is also very acceptable. And it's also very acceptable to get remarried to the same person. I know two people in my life that got divorced, and years later they got remarried to each other. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful story of God's grace and restoration and healing. It's always a possible option. Don't rule it out. But oftentimes, we miss the mark. And I say the word miss the mark. That's really the definition of the word sin. But we miss the mark when it comes to a relationship because of a lack of understanding. Because of a lack of understanding. That's the first blank there in your outline. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And then he says, In all you're getting, get understanding. Get understanding. You know, I like to share a joke every once in a while when we talk about marriage. I talk about a man that was walking up and down the coast of California one day. And he was walking the coastline along the beach, and, and he stumbled across uh, a, a little thing in the sand, and he tripped over it. And he began to look at it, and he began to rub it, and, and this genie popped out. True story. All right, I'm just seeing if you're paying attention or not. And the genie said to him, sir, I am empowered to grant you a wish, anything that your heart desires. And he says, well, sir... He says, I, I've lived here in California for many, many years, and I've never been able to go to Hawaii. I just can't afford an airline ticket, but I could afford to drive. He said, it'd be nice if, if we could have uh, some type of bridge, some type of road that goes here from California to Hawaii. The genie says, you know, I, I've never denied a wish before, but the amount of resources and, 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 and workforce and all the things that it would take to make that, is there anything else that you would like? The guy says, well, I've been married for 40 years and I've never been able to understand my wife. Can you give me the ability to understand women? The genie says, will that be two lanes or four lanes? <laughs> Sometimes understanding each other is a very difficult thing. But I want you to understand that men are different than women. Have you ever figured that out before? You ever notice that? I put a few things here in your outline this morning that I have learned in 34 years of marriage when it comes to the differences between men and women. First of all, men are taught to fight their emotions. Be a man. Don't, don't cry. Don't, don't let them see you get upset. Fight your emotions. Come on. Be tough. Be a tough guy. Women are taught to express your emotions. It's okay, honey. Let it out. Go ahead. Have a good cry. That's a major difference when it comes to men and women. And I tell you, when you get into a relationship with somebody of the opposite sex, it's very difficult to understand that difference, you know? And sometimes women, when the tears begin to flow, men just don't know what to do because they've never experienced that before. Oh, no, don't cry, don't cry. And sometimes women use those tears to their advantage, don't you, ladies? You know how to use those tears to get things that you want. Don't look at me like I'm speaking Spanish this morning. You know what I'm saying today. For a man, words are enough. I said it. I said I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, for women, those words have to have feeling behind them. I can't tell you how many times I've said I'm sorry to my wife. She said, you don't mean that. The words weren't enough. There had to be feeling behind the words. There had to be emotion behind the words. Men, we like to bottle up emotion. Women, they've got to have an emotional connection with each other. Things have to have a connection in here, in the heart, a heart to heart. You ever seen a, a woman, they put up a sign in their home is where the heart is. It's not enough just to have a home. There has to be an emotional connection to that home. Very important. Men are stimulated by sight. And I wish I had more time to go into that today. But this is one of the reasons that so many men struggle with uh, different things when it comes to uh, lust and, and, and things like that in our world today. We live in a very visual world. And those things are, are plastered right in front of our faces many times every day of our life. 
And men are stimulated by those things, by those visual images. Women are stimulated by words, stimulated by words. And I know I've shared this before, but I think the studies have shown that the man on the average speaks about 20,000 words a day, and a woman speaks 40,000 words a day. And one of the struggles is that when a man comes home, he's used up all of his words, and his wife, she's only used half of her words. And he comes home, and, and, and they, she wants to talk. And uh, he's like, what's for dinner? You know, he sits down. He doesn't want to. He's, he's all spent. All of his words have been spent. And she's got all these words to use up. And it's a challenge because men just want the headlines all the time. And women want all the fine print. They want all the little details of everything. And so we need to understand that, that there has to be a balance. And we have to come together. And we have to understand each other. We can't just ignore each other. We can't just blow that off because they're different. Say, you got to be more like me. It doesn't work that way. We have to find that middle ground. Men, we embrace routine. We embrace routine. I always think of my dad, you know, who was a barber for 54 years, was it? And uh, 59, 59 years, many of those years, he drove the same route to work every day, took that bologna sandwich and an apple every day for lunch, right? I, I think he changed it up at one point. Yeah, so many, many years, the same lunchbox. I mean, we're just creatures of routine. We have this routine. We have this habit. I know I'm that way. I get up in the morning. I got this routine. I don't like to change things. My wife likes to change things all the time. She loves to rearrange the furniture about once a month. She'll take everything out of the cupboard and move it from this cupboard to that cupboard. I'm completely lost when we do the dishes at home. She likes to wash. I like to dry, but I don't know where anything goes. I really don't. And she gets frustrated with me because I'll say, honey, where does this go? Come on, it's the 10th time you've asked me where that goes. I don't know. I don't know where they go because every time I try to figure it out, she moves them all to a different place because men like routine and women like variety. And so consequently, men, we don't like people when they move our stuff or touch our stuff, right? We've got it in a certain spot in a certain way. And so that routine is very important to us. Lynn and I struggle in one area in the fact that I, I like to be home. I can't wait when I'm out at work, when I'm out running around, and, and many nights I get home late. I can't wait to get home so I can be home. She can't wait for me to get home so we can go out because many times she's been sitting home and she wants me to take her somewhere. She wants to go places. She wants to do things. She likes to, 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 uh, that sense of adventure. I like that sense of, again, just, just being a homebody, routine. Sitting and doing nothing is... Not a problem for me. And she can't sit still. She likes to go, go, go. Uh, we, we've gone on vacation a couple of times. I remember we went up to a cottage a few years ago. And I got her to sit in that cottage for, for a half a day. Just to sit and, and relax and do nothing for a half a day. And at about 1 o'clock, she said, come on, we got to go somewhere. I got to do something. So I got her to relax for a little while. So that was good. This is a great sermon for our anniversary. It is. Thanks, babe. <laughs> She just said it's a great sermon for our anniversary. So, <laughs> Men won't reveal their weaknesses. Women, you're quick to point out all your weaknesses. We don't like to, to admit we have any weaknesses. And women, you're hard on yourself, harder than, than men ever are on themselves, always pointing out your flaws and your weaknesses. Men, we don't need help. We don't need help with anything. We won't ask for directions. We don't need anybody to, to help us. But we get mad when nobody helps us. Uh, I'm that way. Nobody helps me, I'm mad, but I will never ask for help. Women, help me, please, please help me. And they ask for help. They'll always admit they need help. I believe that all relationships go through four basic stages, whether it's a man and wife relationship or even sometimes just a basic friendship. The first stage is the infatuation stage. I like to call this the character discovery stage. On the average, it lasts about two and a half years. You meet somebody, you begin to go out, you fall in love. You're just absolutely gaga over that person. You love being with them. You love holding their hand. You love just being in their presence. Sometimes you don't have to do anything or go anywhere. Just sit. You know, I remember when Lynn and I were dating, we'd just sit in her family room and watch TV for hours and hours and hours. And sometimes, I, I, you know, one in the morning, I'd go home, 1.30. It didn't matter. Every day we wanted to be together. We wanted to, to be in each other's presence. We didn't have to, to have any grand experiences or anything like that. Just infatuated and and in love with each other. 
Then after about two and a half years, you get into the reality stage. You go from character discovery to character building. What happens is for better wears off and for worse begins to set in, right? For richer wears off and for poorer begins to set in. And so hidden things begin to come to light. The sin of familiarity begins to set in. You begin to be, get familiar with each other. You, uh, you know, Jesus, the Bible says, he could no longer do any mighty works in his own hometown because they were familiar with him. And so you don't walk on water in that person's eyes anymore. You can't do any mighty works in their eyes anymore. You're not the person that, that they were gaga over in that infatuation stage. You begin to see their flaws and their faults. They begin to do things in front of you that they didn't do before, right? You begin to, if you got married, wake up in the morning and, and, and the breath stinks and the hair's all over the place and all of a sudden, well, who is this person? I never saw this during the infatuation stage. Things that were overlooked during the infatuation stage now become a point of contention. You used to think, oh, I can live with that, I can deal with that, but after so many years, it begins to rub you the wrong way. It begins to frustrate you. It begins to anger you. It gets real quiet. Nobody's willing to say amen during this part of the series. And many of the differences that attracted you to each other now become a point of frustration if you don't understand and accept the fact that they're different, that they're unique. You begin to realize that, wow, this person's a lot different than I am. You know, you come from this background, you were raised this way, you did things that way, you were, you were brought up this way, and they were brought up completely differently. And you, you, you completely different. I'm sorry, my English is bad this morning. And, and so when you, you get closer to each other, you begin to spend more time together, maybe you're living under the same roof, you begin to realize, man, this person's completely different than I am. And that's okay. Because one of the struggles in every relationship, whether it's a man-woman relationship, a friendship, whatever it might be, a boss, a teacher, a parent, pastor, you have to understand that different isn't always wrong. Just because they don't do it your way doesn't mean it's the wrong way to do it. Different can be a very good thing. That God has brought that person into your life with a different way of doing things, a different perspective to, to complete you, to complement you, to help you, yes. not to frustrate you. And so you have to look at their, their differences as something that, that maybe can be a blessing to you, maybe can be a perspective that you haven't seen, that you need to change. My wife hates this, but I always talk about shoes when we first got married. I think I own three pairs of shoes. And uh, tennis shoes and dress shoes, may have only been two pairs of shoes. Yeah, two pairs of shoes. She owned this little Horizon TC3 when we got married. And when we moved into our house, I, I filled that car entirely with just boxes of shoes. It took me one whole trip just to bring her shoes to the house. She, I counted, don't, don't argue with me, baby. I know this is, this is good. <laughs> I counted at least 40 pairs of shoes, right? And I thought to myself, oh my Lord, what did I marry into? This woman is shoe crazy. And there was nothing wrong with that. And, wrong with that. Amen. and what I had to learn was that I couldn't wear black shoes with brown pants. I'll never forget the first time I did that. I walked out, we were getting ready for church. I walked out, I had my brown pants on, my black shoes. She goes, is that what you're wearing to church? <laughs> I said, yeah. Now, brown shoes have become more stylish now with black pants, but back then it wasn't, you know. And she says, uh, you can't wear black shoes with brown pants. And I said, oh, I don't have another pair of shoes. <laughs> so I had to learn to get some more pairs of shoes to go with different colors and different outfits. So different isn't always wrong. My wife was very different from me, and I was very different from her. And I've helped her in a lot of ways. Amen, honey. <laughs> and uh, oh, we did bring her car to church this morning. And she's helped me to grow immensely in many, many ways. And so what you have to do sometimes when you get into this stage of resentment, character testing, is you have to go back to the foundation and find out what drew us together. What, what was the foundation? What attracted me to this person? And begin to rediscover those things. Uh, men 
Think through on the inside before making decisions. We talked about this, and then they'll talk about it. Women are different because they talk about things, and then they make their decision. And so you have to understand all of these differences. This is why men oftentimes can be silent uh, when you're talking, ladies, because in their mind, well, you didn't ask a question, so there's nothing to answer. And so you need to understand these, these differences between each other. Women process things verbally. Men process things internally. And neither one are wrong. And what you have to do during this time of, of uh, character building, I'm sorry, I've skipped ahead in my outline here. And number three, the third stage is resentment after you come into that reality. And that's a stage of character testing. Character testing. So when things begin to frustrate you, now your character is being tested. What do I do? I've made a commitment. I've, I've uh, given a vow. I've made a pledge. I took an oath to be with this person. And my character is being tested. And the one who was once the object of your affection now becomes the target of your frustration. And at this point, three critical things must happen or the relationship will be lost. Number one, you have to remember that you are different and adapt to that. Remember that you're different and adapt. Number two, you have to ask for forgiveness and grant forgiveness. Forgiveness is a very important part of every relationship, grace and mercy and extending those things. And sometimes, guys back me up on this, <clears throat> I've asked for forgiveness for things to this day. I still don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> But let me teach you guys three words that go together very well, or three phrases. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. Yes, amen. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. And ladies, this will work for you too. See, because I believe, and I've said this many times in the church, it's more important to be righteous than it is to be right. And the righteous thing to do in any relationship, when you get to this resentment stage, when your character is being tested, when you begin to be, get frustrated with each other, when reality begins to set in, and you're arguing and you're fighting and, and, and there's strife and there's division in your home, somebody's got to step up and say, okay, we've got to heal this. We've got to come back to the place where we began. We've got to get back to, to, to where things were good before they went off the tracks, off the rails, before the wheels began to fall off. And I'm sorry. Whatever part I've played in this struggle, whatever part I've played in this, this uh, contention, I'm wrong. Please forgive me. And let's get back to the foundation. Let's get back to that infatuation. Let's get back to falling in love with each other. Whatever we did to fall in love with each other, let's do it all over again. And let's get back to that place where we once were before we began to resent each other, before our character began to test us in these areas. And then the third thing, well, let me read this scripture, Ephesians chapter four in verse 32. Paul writes these words. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiveness is such a powerful force. It affects uh, your faith. It affects your prayers. If you're living in bitterness and unforgiveness, the Bible says, don't come and ask something from God. He says, go deal with that, that strife. Go deal with that relationship first before you come and pray because it hinders your prayers. It affects your relationship with God. We need to understand this as Christian believers, that our relationship with each other is closely connected to our relationship with God. And if there's strife and division and contention with each other, again, whether it's man and woman or friend, it will affect your relationship with God. I've said this in this series earlier. I'll say it again, and I think my wife has this on a plaque somewhere in our home. The closer we get to each other, the closer we will get to God. Can I tell you why? Because God lives in the people around you. And you want to get close to God, you've got to get close to the people around you. And if there's, that's an amen for my grandson back there. <laughs> and if there's division and contention between you and God lives in them, guess what? It's pushing you away from God. That's good preaching this morning. And so number three, love is a decision. The only way to get out of this resentment stage is to decide to love. I choose to walk in love. 
So many people, and I, I crack up, especially at young people, oh, I'm in love. You don't even know what love is. Love is a decision. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. When you're in the infatuation stage, you're not in love. You're in love with being with a person, but you really don't even know that person yet. Love is a decision. And love doesn't even come in to play until there's disagreement, right? You don't have to decide to love as long as you guys are all googly eye with each other and, and, and you don't disagree. Whatever you want, sweetie, I'll do it. You know, there's no contention. There's no, love's not even a, a something you have to deal with until there's disagreement. Now you have to decide, am I going to love this person? Am I going to forgive them? Is it going to be, am I going to be with this person unconditionally, whether we agree or not? Is my commitment to this person unending? Am I going to be unselfish? Am I not going to insist on my own way? I love 1 Corinthians 13. It defines love. It's patient. It's kind. It's long-suffering. It's gentle. That love doesn't take a record of wrongs. It believes the best of every person. That's what love's all about. It's not arrogant. It's not prideful. It's not boastful. I'm going to decide it's not about me. I'm not insisting on my way, but it's about somebody else. That's what you decide to love. I don't care about my way. I don't care if I'm right. I don't care about my needs. I'm going to love this person and focus on their needs, their desires, what they want. I'm going to pour myself into them. That's what love is all about. God so loved the world that he what? He gave. See, the infatuation stage is what I'm getting. Oh, I'm enjoying this. It's me, 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 me. A lot of people are, what's in it for me? Or I got some. Or It's all me. It's not about getting. Love is about giving and giving and giving and giving. Amen. So we go from the infatuation stage, character discovery, to the reality stage, character building, to the resentment stage, character testing, to the rebuilding stage, character application, character application. And it takes two to rebuild any relationship. It takes two to make it. It takes two to break it. You can blame that one person for the problems in your relationship all you want, but it takes two. It takes two to make it work. It takes two to make it fail. And unfortunately, many people recycle rather than rebuild. What do you mean by that, Pastor? They just decide that I'm done with this, so I'm going to take what I learned, and I'm, I'm going to build again with somebody else, somebody different. And so we recycle these things. And what happens, because we never deal with the real root and the real issue, so many times the problems just start over again. Do you know the divorce rate among people that are remarried is higher than those who are married for the first time? Why? Because they just recycle. They don't try to rebuild. They just recycle. And they cast things away for someone else to benefit from its value. That's what we do when we recycle. But I want to encourage you, the rebuilding stage, you have to dig down to your foundation, restore what your relationship was built upon, and recommit to each other. Go back to start and take new paths when you're faced with choices. I'll say that again. Go back to start. And at some point, you went down a path that's taken you to a place you don't want to be. It's like a corn maze. You know, this time of year, you ever go out in a corn maze and you take a path and all of a sudden you realize I'm at a dead end. What do you do? You go back to where you took that wrong turn and you go in a different direction. That's how you rebuild relationships. Where did we go wrong? What, where did we take a wrong turn? Where did we get off the tracks? Let's go back to that place. And again, forgiveness, I hate to harp on that this morning, but this will never work if you keep bringing up all of the mistakes and the flaws and all the, the things of the past. You can never rebuild unless you forget those things which are behind and press on to the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You can't keep digging up the garbage and expect to have a successful relationship. But go back 
and start making better choices, different choices, take a new path. Number three this morning, this is kind of uh, a different direction, different subject, but there are different relationship parasites, different things that will get into your relationship. I call them parasites and begin to eat away at your relationship. First of all is addictions. You say, Pastor, I don't do drugs. You know, there are a lot of different addictions. Video games, shopping, gambling, television, movies, there's uh, alcohol, obviously, is an addiction. There's all kind of different addictions. And they can eat away at a relationship and destroy a relationship. Second of all, and I, I bring both ends of the spectrum, lust is a relationship par uh, parasite. You can't get enough of something. But abstinence is also a relationship parasite when you're not willing to do something. Amen. I'll just leave that right there. Third is anger. Violence, abuse, bottled up emotions. You need to sit down and deal with things. You need to, to talk about things. You can't bottle them up. My mom used to cook years ago with a pressure cooker. Uh, anybody ever cooked with a pressure cooker, seen it before? Put things in there, cover the lid, let that water boil, and every once in a while you'd hear the, the little release on the top go, tsh, tsh, tsh. and that's what people do. They let things boil up on the inside of them. You might let a little go out tsh, tsh, every once in a while, but then all of a sudden something happens and pow, that thing just explodes because it's all been bottled up on the inside. That anger bottled up is a parasite to any relationship. You've got to deal with things. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Take care of it. Don't bottle it up. Don't hang on to it. Number four, deceit. And I use the word deceit because sometimes we lie and sometimes we just don't say things. It's the same thing. Well, I didn't say anything. Yeah, but you, you withheld information. That's deceit. That's deceit. And I know some couples where uh, one, one of the people or both of the people in the relationship have a whole other life that their partner knows nothing about. How many times have you seen that? You know, where this guy has, has a whole other family that his wife never knew about. Maybe you don't go to that extreme, but there's a whole side of you that you don't let anybody see. Be real. Be yourself. Especially in front of the person that you're spending your life with. You, you've got to let them know who you are. It's not fair if they don't know what's going on. If you have this whole other life that they're not a part of, that's not a marriage. It's not a partnership. Number five, perfectionism. You have to allow your partner the ability to fail. You've got to give them the opportunity to screw up sometimes. None of us are perfect. And if, you're, if you think you married Mr. Perfect, you're too late. My wife married him. Oh. <laughs> None of us are perfect. And if your partner doesn't have the opportunity, the freedom to screw up every once in a while, without you extending them grace and mercy, it's going to be a very difficult relationship. They're going to probably be very frustrated and possibly at some point want to walk away because nobody's perfect. Nobody will ever live up to that. Those expectations are measure up. We all have to have the grace to fail. But don't use that as an excuse, right? You know, there, there, there's a... Not necessarily a limit to God's grace, obviously, but, but at the same time, that doesn't mean you keep screwing up so that that person just keeps forgiving you over and over and over again. We talked about that in our circle uh, with our young marrieds last, last uh, couple weeks ago. You know, it, it's important that you work on your screw-ups and your failures, but it's also important that you have the grace and the mercy to be able to fail. Selfishness, number six, is a parasite. Again, you can't live for yourself and make a relationship successful. And uh, number seven, unforgiveness and bitterness. We've talked a lot about that. So finally this morning, I want you to understand your struggle is not unique. Your struggle is not unique. And this is why we encourage interaction among one another in the church. People that are similar to you. We've got this great circle uh, that we lead for young couples, for, for uh, families, people that, that uh, are 
in these stages that we talked about this morning. We have another circle uh, for people that are, are a little bit older in their twilight years. We have a circle for ladies. We're looking to develop all kind of other kinds of circles. Why? Because it's important for you to get around people that have things in common with you, for you to see that you're not the only one going through what you go through. And sometimes being around those other people will make you feel much better about your relationship. I always love to talk about this couple in the church that uh, they haven't been a part of the church in a long time, so don't think you know who they are. But uh, they had one of the biggest struggles in their relationship, and I understand it eventually ended in divorce. I love them dearly, precious, sweet people. But uh, they would come to church sometimes and just argue the whole way to church. And sometimes one of them would be in church and the other wasn't because they were in an argument. I'll never forget the day a guy walk, the guy walked into the church with a big black eye. And I said, what the heck happened to you? He goes, I don't know. One minute I was just talking to my wife, the next minute she, bam, it hit me right in the eye. And I couldn't help but laugh because it was, the relationship was comical. And anytime I had a couple in the church that were arguing and frustrated with each other, I'd say, do you, you see them guys? Wait, go talk to them for just a little bit. Maybe, maybe they'll help you. And they'd go over and talk to them too for 10 minutes and they'd come back and go, okay, pastor, we got it pretty good. You know, because they had so many struggles. Just being around them made you realize, gosh, it could be a lot worse than what we have right now. And that other people struggle the same way we struggle. And it's okay. It's okay. We all go through struggles. Your struggle is not unique. Somebody knows what you go through. And can I tell you this? Jesus Christ knows what you go through. The Bible says he was tempted and tested in all ways like we are. He knows. The Bible teaches that there's three points of struggle that every person goes through in life, that there's three points of temptation. And Jesus went through every one of them when, when Satan came and tempted him in the wilderness that day. There's three basic points of temptation. And he knows what you're going through. The Bible says we don't have a high priest that can't identify with our struggles. He was in all ways tempted, tested, struggles as we are. Why? So that we can come confidently to him and boldly to him and say, Lord, I know you understand me. I think there's some people that just don't pray because they don't think God would ever understand what they're going through. God knows what you're going through. And the greatest thing that you can ever do when you're struggling in any relationship is to involve God in that relationship. I know couples that I'll call them and say, I hadn't seen you in church the last couple weeks. Yeah, we've been arguing. Well, come and worship together. Don't you think that would help? Come and pray. Come and seek the Lord. Come and hear the word of God. Don't you think that would help your relationship? But no, we tend to pull back from God. God is the answer when you're struggling with your problems. Our passage this morning, our text says, God will never allow you to face something that you can't resist but he's never intended for you to resist it alone. He's never intended for you to resist it in your own strength. He wants to give you the mercy, the grace to help in your times of need. And so many people, they want to flee rather than fight. Escape is too easy. God says he will give you a way out. And many times that way out is, is a door up, a door into his presence, a door closer to him. But you have to fight for your relationship with God and you have to fight for your relationship with each other. God will always provide a way out. The last part of our text this morning says that uh, when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. That word endure means to stand up under, to stand up, to stand during that time. Stand up under what? Under God's word, under God's covering, under God's anointing, under the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit of God. God will give you a way out. Your struggle is not unusual. And I want to say this in closing this morning. Temptation is not sin. Many of you, when you go through a relationship, you're tempted in many ways. I wish I had time this morning to go in a lot of those different ways, but many of you, I think I can hear it processing in your mind. You've been tempted. Tempted in different ways. Temptation is not a sin until you act on that temptation. Don't act on the temptation. Begin to deal with it right now. God has a way out. 
He understands Jesus was tempted in all ways, the Bible says. Always, yet without sin. If you're tempted this morning, come to Jesus. He understands. He has a way out. And that way out is a way higher. That way out is something that will strengthen your relationship. It's not a way out of the relationship. It's a way out of the temptation. It's a way out of the sin. And it's God's way. And I want to encourage you to follow God's way this morning. Have I helped anybody this morning? I hope I have. I hope that this has been an encouragement to you this morning. Understand each other. Work to understand each other. Relationships take work. And you have to work to understand. Don't fight your differences. Embrace your differences. Learn how to forgive. Learn how to rebuild. Learn how to fight parasites in your relationship. And learn how to involve God in your relationship. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that it has helped those that are here. I pray that your your word is drawing us closer to you and closer to each other. I pray that if there's anybody that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would open their heart to you today, Father, I pray in Jesus' precious name. If that's you today, either watching us online or here with us in this room, and you want to get your heart right with God, you've been struggling, you've been tempted, you've been fighting things, and you think you're the only one going through what you're going through. And you didn't think you could come to God because you didn't think he'd understand. Now today you realize your struggle is not unique, that God understands and he's here for you. His arms are open wide. He wants to receive you. He wants to bless you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to strengthen you and help you. Don't run from him. Run to him today. That's you this morning. I want to lead you in this simple prayer. I want you to open your heart and embrace God. Say this with me. Say, God... I need you. I open my heart and I ask you to come live in me. I receive your Holy Spirit. Strengthen me. Deliver me. Guide me. Set me free. Help me, Lord. Fill me with your love, your joy, and your peace. Help me to get back to where I need to be and take the right path. Forgive me for my sin. I receive you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If God is blessing you, if these uh, messages have been a blessing you, tell us about it. I like to be encouraged sometime. Share with us what God is doing in your life. If you've given your life to Christ today, go online, send us a message, let us know. We love you. I just want to say one thing. If Uh-oh. you want to come back next It takes a lot to get her up on this stage. I must have done something this morning. I'm in big trouble. Pray for me. Pray for me. We love you. Fellowship with each other a little bit before you leave today. Come back and bring a friend next week. God bless. Have a great day.